Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the St. Johnsbury Athenaeum and our third lecture for the 2013 Arts and Culture Series. We created the Arts and Culture Series last year to allow members of our community and beyond to share their passions and experiences with patrons and friends of the Athenaeum. It is the goal of the Athenaeum through her staff and trustees to continue serving as stewards of our culture and heritage and develop a greater exchange for learning and experience. We are pleased to host nine lectures this year. Of particular interest, before we get started, I want to make sure everyone was aware of our largest fundraising event that we're going to be holding um, in May of 2013. It, there's a little flyer on all of your chairs. It's the Hidden Treasures Gala, and it um, is going to highlight uh, several key exhibits that feature items from our collection that most people have never seen before. And there are really some amazing things. And um, Howard Coffin, the Civil War author, will be joining us as guest speaker, and he will be signing and introducing his new book during that event. So if you have any questions regarding that, just contact me here at the Athenaeum, and there's information regarding tickets on the back of the form. This presentation is also sponsored by the Vermont Humanities Council through its Speakers Bureau program. In addition to providing events such as this one, the Council sponsors reading and discussion programs, a variety of literacy programs, and other statewide events. The Vermont Humanities Council is dedicated to creating a state in which every individual reads, participates in public affairs, and continues to learn throughout life. This presentation is hosted by the Athenaeum. May I please ask everyone to turn off your mobile devices? Matt is in the back there, and he's recording this for us. And we will be uploading this to our YouTube page. So if you could just turn off your phones, please, that would be great. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Athenaeum trustee Bill Graves, who will be introducing tonight's speaker. Thank you, Mel. Um, Glad to see so many folks here tonight. Um, since Mel brought up the subject, as a trustee, <clears throat> I'm supposed to sell a certain number of tickets to the gala. So I brought the tickets that I'm supposed to sell, and if anybody would like to buy one, I'd be happy to sell it to them. Um, so good, th this, this evening, we're here to welcome Douglas Brooks for his presentation, uh, An Apprentice Boat Builder in Japan. Um, woodworking in Japan has a tradition as a craft performed with honor and has its foundation in art form. To quote, the apprentice boat builder system produced craftspeople with incomparable skills, yet required an intense devotion and seriousness. To the point even, and I continue to quote, when the apprentice is forbidden from speaking because one learns from observation and perseverance. Here in St. Johnsbury, uh, we, we may know and we may have known someone who was apprenticed to a school for violin crafting or main boat building or custom furniture, cabinet making, and Adirondack boat building. In Europe, some of the building crafts still require seven years of observation from a student before a slate or thatch or peg is placed. Even in our Vermont, where traditions still bear some influence, I don't know of any students, apprentices, journeymen in the crafts and trades who will be silent, as the Japanese master requires, as the master here in Vermont teaches. Um, especially since some techniques have no written record. Let's give our attention now to Doug about a boat builder. He's a, a museum pieces of replicas of North American boats. Doug is a writer, a researcher, with two books out, and I believe he brought a book that he could share with us. So please welcome Douglas Brooks. Uh, thank you very much, and it's a great pleasure to be here, um, thanks to the Athenaeum and the Vermont Humanities Council. 
Uh, so before we begin, I, uh, I cleared this with our videographer, and it's okay to interrupt me at any point during the talk to ask questions. Uh, I find as I give these talks that often the questions that come from the audience lead the talk in better directions than I might take the talk. So um, with that, uh, feel free to call out. Uh, I did bring a copy of my first book, and I'll mention it in the course of the talk, and I do sell this book. Um, it's in English and Japanese, and you're welcome to take a look at it after the, uh, after the talk. And I also have uh, my business card, so please feel free to take a card and keep in touch. So uh, we begin with an iconic uh, image of Japan. Probably all of you have seen the, this woodblock print, Great Wave off Kanazawa. And maybe you never realized that there's actually Japanese boats, traditional boats, uh, in that image. And we're going to see boats tonight that I built that are quite similar to this. I'm going to start with a very poor homemade slide um, of Japan. And the, the bold red lines represent my travels around Japan. Uh, Japan consists of 47 prefectures, and I have traveled to all but two of them, primarily looking for traditional boat builders and also studying with five boat builders. And I'm going to just point out to set the stage tonight because the talk is going to go chronologically through all five of my apprenticeships. So my first apprenticeship was on Sado Island here in the Sea of Japan. My second and third apprenticeships were in Tokyo Bay. My fourth apprenticeship, oh, it went off the screen, is right up here at the, on the Pacific coast at the northern end of the main island. And this is the Tsunami Coast. Actually, the village I lived in was slightly damaged. It was at the northern edge of the Tsunami Zone. And then my fifth, most recent apprenticeship is not on the map. It was in Okinawa, which is way, way, way off to the south. So we'll begin with that. So in 1990, I traveled to Japan. Uh, my college roommate was from Hiroshima. And for eight years, he badgered me about coming to Japan. And I did so, and I went to the country um, with a, photo, a very interesting photograph showing a very strange boat. And uh, I asked my roommate when I saw him to read the caption on the photograph. And he said, all it says is Sado Island, village of Ogi. And so I got out my map and I traveled to Sado and found these boats. And these are called Taraibune, which literally means tub boat. And these are still found, still used on Sato Island for fishing. It's the only place in Japan that still uses them. And you can see the conventional fishing boats in the background. Um, but these are literally barrels um, that people go out to sea in. Now this man is steadying the boat with his paddle, looking down through a wooden box with a glass bottom. And when he sees the catch, on the bottom, he can maneuver himself over it, and he can grab any one of these different kinds of spears. Um, this is a great picture. That's a Sazae spear, which is a little conch shell. That's an abalone spear, and that's a seaweed spear. So he's outfitted to get any of the three major catches that are, are procured from these boats. Um, and the reason these boats survive to this day and the reason they were very popular is Sado, this corner of Sado, has a, a volcanic coastline, which you can see here. And these sharp rocks, if you can imagine this setting in any kind of a sea, any kind of a wind or waves, a conventional boat would just be smashed to pieces. But these tub boats can maneuver inshore right up close to the rocks where the fishermen believe actually the best catch is. Um, these boats were also traditionally used by women. As ancient seeming, as ancient looking as they, they may seem, they were only introduced about 125 years ago when somebody cut a barrel in half, threw it in the water, and figured out you could use it as a boat. And when that was done, it changed the fishing economy of this part of the island and father kept the conventional fishing boat, but now mother could go fishing. So traditionally, these boats are used by women. And to this day, most of the fisher persons using tub boats are women. Uh, it is classic Japanese barrel making. And one of the really interesting features of it is the braided bamboo hoops. That's uh, split bamboo, intricately braided, that holds the boats together. And if you go to Sato Island, there is a tourist company where women, only women, 
dressed up in what's considered the traditional Sato Island uh, uh, clothing will give you a ride. And my first teacher was very proud of the fact that he built uh, the first glass-bottomed tub boat, and these school children are looking down through a glass window in the bottoms of the boats. And the reason this kind of fishing works, and that kind, this, this kind of fishing of spearing uh, things off the bottom is quite common in Japan, and you, you get an idea of the clarity of the water. And you also notice that this woman, uh, who's very elderly, is paddling from the bow of the boat. These, uh, these boats are propelled from the front. So in the sculling motion with the paddle, you're pushing water underneath the boat and pulling yourself forward. It's not easy. And the thing that gets me about that photo is she's probably in her 70s or 80s, and she's doing that one-handed. And I have yet to be able to do that one-handed. So it's a, it's a very skilled uh, thing. And also, the boats are not round. They are oval. And in one village, and it's men only, does that surprise anyone? Uh, the men in one village put outboard motors on their tub boats. Uh, but you notice the way they steer. The paddle is out in front of the boat. Uh, it kind of terrifies me. But um, yeah, so these men, uh, these men, and I, it was explained to me that for some reason, this is not considered a decent fishing ground and that the men in this village have to travel. They have to go about a mile down the coast, and that's why they put outboard motors on their tub boats. And so on that very first trip, I happened to meet this man, who at the time I met him in 1990 was the last builder of tub boats. And I went back in 1992 and 1994 and along with uh, native speakers as translators, I did oral interviews with him. Uh, and in 1994, on my third visit, he invited me to be his apprentice. Um, in Japan, the crafts, to this day, are handed down from master to apprentice. You find, in the traditional crafts, you find little, if any, written material documenting the crafts. We take for granted, if I want to learn how to knit, I can go to YouTube, I can go to the internet, I can find a book, and I can learn how to knit. That same thinking, that same reality, really largely doesn't exist in Japan. If you want to learn how to do some kind of special dyeing of kimono fabric, it is just understood in Japanese culture that you must find a master. No one will look at you and say, go get a book, find a YouTube video, et cetera, take a class. Uh, and so this is the kind of world I was suddenly thrown in uh, and I jumped at the opportunity when my teacher, uh, Mr. Fuji, invited me to be his apprentice and he had never had an apprentice. I was his sole apprentice and actually I'm the sole apprentice of all five uh, craftspeople you'll see tonight. Uh, Mr. Fuji's father and grandfather were coopers. These are miso tubs and these tubs to give you an idea of scale, these tubs are about 10 feet tall and 12 feet in diameter. And they are as much as 100 years old. And miso is fermented soybean paste, which is a product on Sato Island and throughout Japan. And the very finest miso is fermented in wood. Most miso is today fermented in stainless steel. But this company still works in wood with wooden vats. And uh, my teacher, uh, actually his early career, he apprenticed with his father in the miso workshop, factory workshop, and his job mainly was repairing these vats, but most importantly, replacing these hoops, because the bamboo hoops would periodically wear out. The tubs, the tubs themselves would last 100 years, but the hoops would last five to 10 years. So he was really a master of the making of the braided bamboo hoops. So I went back for my apprenticeship, and as the, my, uh, the man who introduced me alluded, um, the very first day on the job, Mr. Fuji, we walked into the workshop, he pointed to a little stool, and he said, sit. And I sat down. And it was a great vantage point to photograph him, because he worked all day planing the staves of our tub boat that we were building together, like most Japanese craftsmen, seated on the floor. The workbench is just a block of wood at his feet. His feet were clamps. 
He could hold the materials with his feet, and he began planing staves. And I sat there for eight hours, and I watched him, and he worked in complete silence. He never looked at me. He never said anything to me. And at the end of the day, he jumped up, and he pointed at the shavings, and he said, clean, and he walked out of the shop. And I started, when I got all the shavings cleaned up, I moved, I was taking them to the burn barrel, which he had in the backyard, and he came rushing out of the house and he said, no, that heats the bath. So that night's bath was heated with the shavings from the day's work. And so I went into the shop the second day, and he pointed to the stool and said, sit. And I sat. It was a great vantage point to photograph him. Uh, And he worked making staves. And it was either on the second day, I may have sat another, an entire day the second day. So either late in the second day or the third day, I was watching him make staves and he suddenly jumped up, handed me the plane and said, work. And he walked out of the shop. (laughs) And so I took his place on the floor and I'd been watching him and I began to plane staves and uh, I thought he went outside to have a cigarette, but he never came back. And my wife told me later at the end of the day that she found him taking a nap. And he was gone for about three hours, and he reappeared in the shop, and he went to my pile of staves, and he went through it. And he said, good, good, bad, bad, good, bad, good, bad. And when he finished going through my pile, he pointed to the bad pile, and he said, fix. And he walked out of the shop for the rest of the day. And so just... In, to encapsulate, and this is a subject that really fascinates me, as, uh, that in the Japanese apprenticeship, you, the apprentice is expected, maybe he's sweeping, very commonly apprentices are sharpening, and that's all they're doing is sharpening tools, definitely cleaning, you know, keeping the shop clean, but at all times they are expected to be paying attention to what the teacher is doing, because one day the teacher is going to say, Now it's your turn, and you are expected to know how to do it and do it correctly the first time you're asked. It's really quite ironic that I went to Japan as an apprentice barely speaking Japanese, and yet I didn't have to speak Japanese because within that context, there is no speaking. And this has been true of all of my uh, studies in Japan, that my, there's no, there's almost been, been almost no give and take, no back and forth, do it like this, do it like this, no, do it like this. The way we teach in the West, it has all been simply, watch me, now do it. And it's sink or swim. And I must admit to you, it really focuses your attention. <laughs> it's, a, it's a really fascinating, fascinating, we could take an entire evening just to talk about that, the nature of craft learning in Japan. Very similar to Buddhist monastic training, which I'm convinced it's completely related to. So the toughest part of building tub boats is the bamboo hoops, at least for me. Uh, You know, the woodworking is not that challenging, but so we cut down 55 foot tall stalks of timber bamboo, split them four ways, then split each those strips again and then shape those strips using a draw knife. He's pulling the strip over a piece of bamboo as a fence, and he's holding the other end of the draw knife with his foot. And by the way, pulling that strip of bamboo as fast as he can, and then braiding into hoops. And here again was an enormous challenge for me as a student. I took a video camera, and the day we did the hoops, um, I was also helped by my wife who is a ba- former basket maker and had an understanding for weaving and braiding and those sorts of things. And I videotaped him and my own efforts to make hoops. And uh, I, I probably, back in America, with little bits of plastic strapping, I probably watched my video a hundred times, but I, did f- I finally figured it out. Um, and that is probably the rarest skill I know because there may, not be, there may not be more than a dozen people in Japan that know how to do this. Traditional coopering, ba- barrel making, has almost disappeared in Japan. In fact, I was in Japan in September, and I visited the last factory in the country that makes traditional sake barrels. Eight foot tall, 
wooden barrels. And actually, the owner told me that he was going out of business. So, um, and that's, this is a very poor quality image, but that's the tugboat that my teacher and I built together. Uh, I never saw my teacher again. He died in an accident a couple of years after my apprenticeship. And as his only student, uh, you know, it was a, it sort of fell on me, or I felt a sense of responsibility to try to continue this craft. Luckily, uh, a, a, um, a foundation on Sato Island contacted me and said, Mr. Fuji has passed away and you were his only student. How, how can we save this, this craft? And I said, well, we'll do the traditional thing and we'll do the modern thing. The traditional thing is I'll teach an apprentice. And so this is my apprentice, uh, a, car a carpenter from Sato Island, and he and I built two tub boats together. But then I told the foundation, we'll do the modern Western thing and we'll publish a book. And so this book, and you're free to take a look at this later, this book is basically a how-to book on how to build these boats. And it's in English and Japanese. And if we want to see the world have more people braiding bamboo hoops, I have a lovely step-by-step -step schematic <laughs> of how you braid bamboo barrel hoops. So it's all in here. And interestingly, too, from the standpoint of documentation, my tubboat drawings in this book are the first published drawings of a tubboat that I know of, and maybe still the only published drawings of a tubboat. So this, this is the kind of thing we're all familiar with in the West. And in Japan, this is all but unheard of. So, And uh, this is my own tubboat here in Vermont. This is out on Kingsland Bay in Ferrisburg. If you're ever out on Lake Champlain and you see me, I have heard the rub-a-dub-dub -dub joke, so I don't, you don't have to try that. You will not be the first one to <laughs> say that to me. But anyway, uh, I do have a tub boat, and um, well, I don't know. If you get over to Virgen's, look me up. Maybe we can go for a ride. Uh, my second apprenticeship in Tokyo Bay was building one of these boats. This is a traditional seaweed gathering boat. This is the community of Urayasu, which is just east of Tokyo. It's the